much. So everyone, we have some minutes for questions. We do also have a roving mic, so can I ask you to raise your arms if you would like to ask a question to any or all of the panel. To say who you are and to do your direction of the speech. The first one at the back, yes. Kate Mack Yates, the Murdoch University Copyright Coordinator. Um, I'm interested in the idea of a separation of copyright for authors and copyright for distributors. Because whilst I agree pretty much with everything that's been said this morning, I have friends who write novels who get published by the university press maybe, and for them copyright is perceived as a you know, call to their, to their ongoing viability. So I'd like to, I wonder if any of you can say a bit more about how, how you envisage we can separate out those two as being Well, I throw it on the table. I had a very interesting conversation last week with David Court, who works in the film industry and is currently coming towards the end of writing a PhD thesis on copyright, drawing on data from the film industry and looking at what authors get in terms of return to their input uh, and extending it to books. And he drew my attention to an article published in 1837 that first put forward this proposition. Um, I haven't, I've, I've found the article, but it's kind of very bad Google digitized copy, um, so I haven't actually read it yet. But from what David said, the idea is that the first publisher would get a publisher's right of, say, five years, which is about what the economist Arnold Plant recommended when he looked at copyright back in the 1930s, whereas the author would actually keep a copyright for life, and there would be constraints over what the, how much the publisher could take uh, from the author. But I don't have a clear proposition. I think the idea is very interesting because when the publishers are lobbying, you know, particularly the very big distributors, they always put the creator card on the table and it's never backed up by the facts. And I think whenever we look at the copyright issue, we must separate out what is this doing to support our creative community, to encourage people to be creative and help them get a return to the work that they, the creative work they've done, and what are the interests of publishing houses? Yeah, and within, and I use that as a generic for all distributors, including Hollywood film studios and so on. And again, there, there's a real difference between small specialty publishers like the university presses, which used to be such a very big part of the scene. But now they've gone out, and, and academics are so busy, they've handed it all over to the private sector, who are getting 35% returns on their investment year after year after year. That's unbalanced. Um, but I think the idea has a great deal of merit in terms of separating out who benefits, who gains, and what is the purpose of the government intervention in this market, and are we achieving that purpose? It is surely not simply to send Australian dollars over to the USA? Um, I might throw a couple of thoughts in. So I, I think that part of it is also um, a, a couple of points. First of all, looking at how the work was funded, right? If it is in the case of an academic work uh, with the, where the time that's been invested into making the work has been publicly funded and the outcome of that work is actually locked away, that's, that's one type of issue. Uh, in the case of things like music, and I mean, I uh, just for one person who made a comment on Twitter that you know we need some creators on the on the panel. Well, I am a creator actually. I remix and write and, and publish a lot of music. Um, and um, in the case of music, there was a great paper by um, Courtney Love. You wouldn't have thought she'd be the most academic of, of writers, but she wrote a fantastic paper about um, about the music industry and basically was able to make the case and demonstrate that. Um, for a band to do actually quite well and then go touring and sell you know, millions of, of um, records, um, the actual amount of money that the um, musicians made was the same as if the four of them had just worked in a petrol station um, it, over that period of time and just been doing the music in the spare time. Um, so the, the, there's a bit of an um, imbalance at the moment as to, to where the money is being made. Um, one of my favourite case studies, and it, admittedly it is, this is somewhat reliant upon um, uh, already having a name, but um, Nine Inch Nails a few years ago did a record where they, um, they had their, you know, uh, the, the, the first quarter of the album was freely available under Creative Commons, 
Uh, the rest of the album was available uh, as MP3s for you know three dollars or, or something. Um, you could get and you could get it under FLAC or high you know res stuff for a little bit more for ten dollars or whatever. Then they had all their artwork and they had I think it was something like a, a thousand uh, stupidly expensive like three hundred and fifty dollar um, um, packs for people who were serious fans. And um, and so they mean they made when you actually sort of sat back and look at it they made. Uh, I think it was a, a, a million dollars or a couple of million dollars or something um, relatively quickly off, off of this one album. And Trent Reznor came out and said, you know, for a week's work, that's not bad, really. <laughs> um, so there's a bit of, um, and, and a lot of young bands and a lot of young um, digital artists and such, they, they get their audience through going to, uh, directly to the people. Uh, again, it's that peer-to-peer -peer thing. So um, the, the value of the traditional distributors of digital content is somewhat, um, questionable, I believe, uh, because the, the value used to be that they were the ones who did the deal with the, rec with the radio station to get you played in order to get you going somewhere. But nowadays, you're playing online anyway, you can build up your own community and you can build up your own fan base. Uh, so um, th I think there's a question in the business model of where the value is uh, for the people doing the distributors of, uh, of any sort of content um, and what the authors can, um, and, and artists can do themselves. Don't have the answer yet. Yeah. Kickstarter. Yeah. On Kickstarter. Yeah. But, um, no, and I wasn't thinking of an academic publishing. I was thinking of the, the almost extinct uh, writer in the attic mm. with her, you know, her pencil and pen, but writing the novel, getting it published. And I know about Cory Doctorow's, you know, sort of how he's made money through CC. But it was more how we can separate out so that. The few creators that are that are hooked into copyright are less affected by the industrial machinations. I guess. Wasn't Fifty Shades of Grey an example of that? <laughs> where somebody, where somebody. I'm sincerely hoping my friend of that book isn't going to be anything like Fifty Shades. Of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm, I, I'm rather rather than rather than comment upon the content. Uh, I'm I'm yes, looking at the distribution was. model, uh, and I, and I think. You know, you really, you, people have got to recognize that we're living in a revolution. It's, it's not, you know, French guillotine stuff. It is nevertheless a revolution. I mean, the remark was made about the amount of information that's coming into government and, and how can you make this intelligible? Well, my answer to that is get used to it uh, and devise some means of filtering the meaningful from the meaningless. Uh, you know, the, it may well be like drinking from a fire hose, but you're going to have to devise a solution for it. And furthermore, you're going to have to listen. Because if you don't listen, you're going to have a dissatisfied community. Again, I emphasise what I said, the consent of the government. Uh, Pia made the comment just a moment ago about 3D printing and, oh wow, this is going to disrupt our business models. Get used to it. Nothing is going to remain static anymore. You don't have the old certainties. Get used to it. You're living in a revolution. Don't complain. Don't drive with a rear view mirror. Start looking ahead and working out what the hell you're going to do about it. You know, I am not interested in that sort of thinking. I'm sorry. I'm blunt, but there it is. Get used to the revolution. Do we have another question? No other questions? I've got one then to perhaps finish off. I wonder if any of the panellists, uh, I guess uh, Judge Harvey in particular, uh, have any thoughts about another big uh, contextual factor for us as we go in further into the 21st century, which is what we in Australia are calling the Asian century, which is powerful new players in terms of international influence and law in the form of the rise of East Asia and South Asia having any kind of effect on these debates. Yeah, I, I, okay. Um, I think one of the things that I noticed, I was in Hong Kong last year, um, and I, I'd, I'd not been to that part of the world before, so it was kind of a new experience. Uh, my wife and I walk a lot, and we also use trains. And one of the things that I was very interested in when I saw people on trains was that almost everybody, everybody, was interfacing with a device of some sort or another. 
Now, uh, I thought to myself, you know, this is the digital native. This is uh, what we're getting used to, what we must get used to. It seems to be a little bit more prevalent in, in Asia, or at least that part of Asia. And I thought, well, if this is the way that it's going to go, uh, it's going to be an interesting world. You see, the people of my generation say, oh, they've got their heads buried in their devices all the time. Yeah, well, okay. Again, I say get used to it. You know, you find this difficult. People of my generation find this difficult to deal with because, as I said, we speak with a different, a different accent. This is the way that people are going to interface with information. They're going to interface with each other. They're going to carry out their social lives and their social development. It's a reality, and it's part of this revolution that we are part of. And if you don't recognise it, you're going to get left behind in the dust, and you're going to wonder why. Thank you. Well, look, I'd like can, you can to... Can I just add a small something yes, on that? Because yes. these are very populous nations we're talking about. And I'm thinking about China and India. And there's two things that strike me. First of all, in terms of Chinese students, they have a very different attitude to teamwork. And, and there's a kind of funny edginess between, like, what's teamwork and what's plagiarism? All right, so, so there's some interesting issues that are raised there about different cultural approaches. But the other thing is that through TRIPS and, and the US-based approach of kind of TRIPS plus treaties, what's being forced on the world is a very old mental model. It's a mental model that supports a very particular business paradigm. And just at the cusp of extremely large economies, just think of the size that the Chinese economy is going to be and the Indian economy is going to be once they have a higher per capita income. And when we are talking about countries with in excess of a billion population, whereas the US, the biggest economy that we know, is of the order of 300, 350 million last time I looked. Now, we're asking to be walked all over with our own retrograde you know, interferences in the market by teaching these people to do this. And then they're going to be bigger than us and stronger than us and where's the money going to flow, right? We're going to bitterly regret all of this stuff. But after I'm dead and buried, so, you know, does it matter? Can I, can I add one last quick thought? Okay, well? yes. Sorry. Um, I, I think also um, this is actually really important with regards to our position in Asia. We are part of Asia Pacific. We are not, you know, on the other side of the planet sitting next to the US. Um, and we need to make sure that we have good relations and good trust in our region, um, particularly given the, the, uh, you know, the flourishing economies that are, that are happening very, very close by. Um, if we are seen to be, and unfortunately I think to some degree we are currently seen to be, um, pushing the agenda of other nations that are not necessarily aligned with the interests of our region, then that doesn't um, bode well for us. It doesn't actually help us have a, a strong voice. Personally, I actually think, and I mean, I've, I've lived in China, I've spent a bit of time in Asia, um, I, I actually think that Australia is very, very well set up to be a, a, a wonderful bridge between the East and the West um, and between different types of cultural perspectives and thinking. Um, but, um, but we need to have a, 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 an independent voice and we need to have a, a voice that is uh, aligned more with regional interests and with our own interests than uh, just, just pushing a different perspective. So again, just speaking as me, not as the government. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Can I ask you to join me in thanking uh, Judge Harvey and our panellists for a very absorbing process. <laughs>